Welcome back to Butler on Business. My name is Alan Butler. Jason is our guest on the phone. Yes, sir, Alan. We're joined now on the phone by Dr. Benjamin Powell. He's the senior economist with the Beacon Hill Institute and a research fellow with the Independent Institute. He earned his Ph.D. in economics from George Mason and has appeared on numerous national radio and television shows, including CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, and Fox Business. How are you doing today, Dr. Powell? Hey, good. Good to be with you. Hey, Alan. Well, today we really want to talk about government spending and maybe from an economics perspective, why it is so difficult to, cu- to cut government spending. I mean, it seems like the polls now are showing a lot of Americans, at least the people I talk to, a lot of Americans are really for cutting government spending, but still nothing seems to get done in Washington. So what, what is maybe an economic reason why it's so difficult to trim back government spending? Yeah, basically government spending cuts just run against the logic of politics. What politicians do to get ahead is they create policies that give a big benefit to a small, well-defined interest group, and they spread that cost across lots of taxpayers. So if it's a a policy that only costs everybody a penny or a few dollars, people don't even know about it or bother to fight against it because it's just not worth their time and effort. Uh, But meanwhile, that transfer goes to one well-identified interest group who does know it and lobbies to keep such policies. So now spending cuts are just the reverse of that. So a general spending cut benefits everybody in society overall, but each particular cut that you make is a rather small benefit for the individual taxpayer, but it does eliminate somebody's favorite program, and they fight against that. So you get this type of stalemate that you've had in Congress where they're talking about $38 billion worth of cuts. Big deal. It's a drop in the bucket. Well, it's, it's, it's really very difficult when you're looking at exactly like you said, these dispersed costs, but really concentrated benefits for, for some specific groups. Can you maybe explain in a little bit more detail, use an example for one particular group, like uh, maybe the sugar industry, how they benefit and the rest of us pay for it? Sure, absolutely. I mean, the UN, United States has quotas on the amount of uh, foreign sugar that can come into our country. As a result, the U.S. price, and this is particularly relevant maybe for your Atlanta audience, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, but the, the result is that the U.S. price of sugar is about uh, twice the world market price of sugar. Uh, so each individual consumer, though, it doesn't cost us that much extra because, you know, it's a trivial fraction of our budget that goes to spending on sugar or goods made with sugar. Uh, but sugar producers are a rather, rather concentrated group in the United States. There's not that many of them, and the a lion's share of the benefits of this quota system go to only a few sugar producers, and particularly the Fungul family of southern Florida. As a result, they make lots of campaign contributions uh, to make sure that the quotas stay intact when we do something like have the, quote, Central American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA. What gets exempted? Sugar. That way, there the Fungul's can keep having their special benefit that makes them millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, but that costs all of us a little bit. And it uh, changes the nature of our products. And that's why I said it's particularly relevant for your Atlanta audience, because anybody Everybody knows if you've had Coca-Cola anywhere else in the world, it tastes different than it does in the United States. That's because of U.S. sugar quotas. Uh, Coca-Cola is made with corn syrup here in the United States, but everywhere else in the world, it's made with sugar. In fact, I was just in Guatemala last week, actually visiting sweatshops, as it may be, uh, and I was enjoying the sugared Coke that I could have there that's hard to get in the United States. Yeah, Dr. Powell, my roommate and I actually, we make a trip every so often over to the local farmer's market and pick up some Coca-Cola that's been imported from Mexico that's made with real cane sugar, and it's delicious, and we like to say you can actually taste the statism. (laughs) Occasionally, I do an exercise in my class called a taste of protectionism, and we do a a side-by-side tasting. (laughs) Well, it, uh, it seems like we're at a very difficult spot right now where it's almost... I mean, nearly impossible, as you're alluding to, to to really cut government spending. How do we even move forward in the right direction? How can we begin to get these special interest groups out of our political system? Well, it's not just a matter of getting their special interest groups out. It's about changing the incentives of politicians. So just electing reformer politicians, new ones, just isn't going to change it. Uh, You know, H.L. Mencken once quipped, he says, some people say we just need to elect uh, gentlemen to politics. Uh, He says, I suspect that would be like trying to carp Uh, cure prostitution by taking the prostitutes out of the whorehouses and replacing them with virgins. The girls would soon cease to be virgins or they'd leap out the windows. Uh, The same is true here in politics. So we've got to do something that changes the incentives of the game, uh, not just rotates the people who are in office. And that means things like a hard budget constraint, Uh, so a balanced budget amendment with teeth, Uh, the lack of the monetary authority to be able to monetize uh, the extra spending. So once you give them a hard budget constraint where they can't borrow and they can't inflate, now they've got to make real trade-offs and spending cuts become more realistic. Are you in favor of going back to the gold standard or the silver standard, the way gold and silver standard? 
Well, I think I, you don't. You shouldn't have both metals be a, a legal monetary unit at the same time with a fixed exchange rate, because that leads to problems. Uh, but either one would be preferable to what we have today, where there's nothing to constrain the inflation, uh, other than government's own restraint and fear of a, a greater hyperinflation. Uh, but ultimately, I would favor a different monetary system, uh, one that would call in economics free banking, which says that basically banking really isn't fundamentally different than other lines of business. And what we need is competition between banks, where each can issue their own notes, and what constrains their note issue is the process of competition between them. Historically, when we've had such a thing, those banks do usually have some form of a metallic uh, standard behind them that they're redeemable in, but would have to let the market sort it out and find out what the correct standard would be, what the right reserve ratio would be, et cetera. Well, Dr. Powell, one of the silver linings, if we can look for any silver linings out of the recent financial crisis and all the debates around our current fiscal uh, disaster we have going on right now with our government is that people are starting to wake up and actually become interested in economics and start asking, they're starting to ask questions, they're starting to look for answers. Do you have any favorite resources that you like to go to where the average person who's maybe not an economist can go to, to learn a little bit more about what's really going on? Well, you've already mentioned Foundation for Economic Education, so uh, fee.org is an excellent website. Uh, the uh, online library of liberty, uh, econlib.org is a great place to go. Uh, if you want video resources, uh, the Institute for Humane Studies has a Learn Liberty website uh, that has a lot of short clips talking about things precisely like what we're talking about today. In fact, I recorded a couple more episodes for them with on, on sweatshops and immigration as well that are going to be released. Uh, that's great. The Independent Institute, independent.org, is another great resource for people to go to. So there's lots out there. Um, and hopefully people will start accessing it and demanding more change from their politicians. Dr. Powell, where do you think this economy goes from here, from where we are right now? Well, I don't, I don't do uh, economic forecasts because they're always wrong. Cause, and it's not because you can't understand economic fundamentals. It's because ultimately it's a game of political forecast of what the various authorities are going to do to intervene in the economy and screw it up. Uh, that said, the long term is there's huge looming debts in Social Security, Medicare, and the fiscal deficit. Uh, that day of reckoning has to come. So that means either some combination of high inflation, default, huge sl slashes in spending. You can't do it with tax increases. And that's going to be a mess, and that day is not that far away. Well, Dr. Powell, I certainly agree. It seems like that any time the politicians get their hands in something trying to, to help out or to try to fix the problems, that it, it doesn't always mesh with the economic realities of what's going on behind the scenes, and it, it seems to create a lot more conflicts than it actually solves. Yeah, unfortunately, the logic of politics runs counter to the laws of economics quite often. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today, and we wish that we could have you on some time again in the future. We'd be happy to. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dr. Powell. We've been speaking with Dr. Benjamin Powell from Suffolk University, and we will be back in a few minutes.